Hi, this is Sherry Schreiber of GettingButter.com, and uh, I figured the title of this video would get your attention, and I hope it has. The truth is I was a lousy therapist. I didn't have the patience to sit with people week after week after week after week and listen to them complain about their pain and what they thought their pain emanated from and what caused their pain and why they were in pain and, and who uh, catalyzed this pain for them. I didn't have the patience to do that. I also did not have the patience to analyze that pain with them. I, they were very good at analyzing that pain for themselves. <laughs> They'd been doing that since they are about two years old, <laughs> trying to put meaning to this pain that they lived with as toddlers once they had vocabulary. So I didn't really see that these methods <laughs> Climbing on board with somebody and hyperanalyzing the shit out of their pain and attaching all kinds of meaning and reasons to it and discovering the etiology of it was really a useful strategy for eliminating that pain and keeping it gone. So I developed tools over the past 18 years of my consulting practice to help people truly heal their pain. Understand, yes, why it was there, but not to dwell on it week to week and not to talk about it and not to analyze it and do all the things that they were used to doing in a psychotherapist's office. That wasn't going to happen with me. No, I wanted to eradicate that pain. Now, I'd worked long and hard at coming up with um, strategies and tools to help me eliminate my pain <laughs> that had always resided in my core. And I had poor self-worth. I was very insecure as a young woman. No way I would have done a video like this without full regalia of makeup and having a perfect hair day. There's no way I would have done that as a young woman because I was fractured and broken inside. And I didn't have the confidence and the self-esteem back then to pull that off. How did I go about helping people heal, really heal? Not talk about their pain, not analyze their pain, but heal it, heal it from the inside out. Well, I taught them self-worth building tools and held their feet to the fire and made them use those tools diligently, religiously, daily. I also helped connect them to the feelings of pain in their body, the emptiness, the sadness, the despair, the discomfort, uh, uh, the deadness, the, the depression, the shame that they'd been running from and trying to avoid their entire lives. Just run away from it. Stay too busy to feel it. Become a gym rat, work out that pain, raise my endorphin levels so that I don't have to feel that pain, live with that pain, confront that pain. Ooh, if I feel my anger coming up, I gotta get rid of it. Let me go work it out at the gym. Worst thing you can possibly do, this is what causes a lot of gym accidents, injuries to your body. Because you walk into the gym wanting to do something good for your body, tone your muscles, strengthen them, and you're walking in with this dark energy that's running the show. How could that possibly be a safe and healthy means for you to deal with that very special emotion? 
So I wanted to help people get rid of their pain, not just talk about it week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, for a fucking lifetime. I mean, really, the, a lot of the people who've come my way for help came to me because they saw that I was not working as a state licensed clinician. I, I was not working as a licensed individual. I was not offering psychotherapy. They tried that for many years. Some of them had been to eight different clinicians. One man I worked with had been to one psychologist for 18 years straight. And he was a mess when he came to me. Within a year, this man had transformed under my care. But he couldn't stand to look at his reflection in his mirror. He, he, he saw himself as hideous when he first came to me. That changed a lot within a year's time. So, by and large, the people who came my way for help didn't want another psychotherapist. They didn't want to partake in what they'd already partaken in and had under satisfying results. They were still in pain. Just because they gained great insight about their pain, perhaps, within those venues, it didn't mean that they got healed from it. Plus, it was really boring for me to do long-term treatment with somebody. Even the work I, I, I evolved into doing with my clients over the past 18 years, it was really boring for me to keep them on long-term. I just didn't want to do it. Now, if they were working hard and inspired to grow and heal, I kept them on. I had infinite patience for that. Some of them were with me more than a year. But I didn't see doing psychology or practicing psychotherapy as a, as a remedy for people's pain. Because if it were a remedy for people's pain, why would they have to be in treatment for years and decades of their life? Maybe since they're teenagers, off and on in treatment, or maybe going straight through their life in treatment. If this was a remedy, a remedy is supposed to repair something. In this case, humans. And I didn't see that going on in my world. So, yeah, while I was an intern, you know, I just sort of naturally thought psychoanalytically. I think you might notice that in some of my writings and my self-help articles online at gettingbetter.com. You might notice that bent in me to think psychoanalytically. But that's not at all <laughs> even close to resembling the kind of work I actually did with my client base. Because it doesn't work. If it worked, people wouldn't be in treatment for decades of their life. Yeah. How could that possibly be? How could that happen? How does that make sense? I'm not here to to put a black smudge on the psychotherapeutic community or that profession. There are people in that profession that I have a great deal of respect for. One of them saved my life when I was 20 years old. A psychiatrist. But I think that there are a lot of times where it's the blind leading the blind, and I'm, I'm so disheartened by this. So when people came to me, they saw on my website, I do not work as a licensed cl clinician. I do, not, I do not carry a state licensure. I am not a psychotherapist. And they were inspired to call. I've had many, many, many psychologists and psychotherapists in my practice. 
over the years. Many. Now, why, I ask you, would they be coming to me, somebody who charged them a, a, a substantially high out-of-pocket fee, <laughs> to get the care I provided, the kind of healing tools and practice that I provided them that was antithetical to psychotherapy, if I was doing psychotherapy? Why would they do that? Wouldn't they want their insurance to at least cover some of those sessions or a portion of those sessions? Of course they would. Only an idiot wouldn't. But they could see that I was offering something very different from what they'd been exposed to before. And this kind of lit them up. This excited them, especially if they had a bad taste left in their mouth after uh, undersatisfying or maybe really negative psychotherapeutic experience. And I've heard some horror stories about those <laughs> over the years. Now, this is not to put down the profession. I think the profession is worthy, and I think that it is very helpful for resolving, helping people come to solutions with certain life struggles, but I've never felt that it really resolved core pain. And so that's what I attempted to do with my clients. Uh, it wasn't mind work at all. It was really soul work. You might say it was boot camp for the soul. Because <laughs> I was really at times having to be harsh with people to get them to utilize the power tools I gave them that would repair their self-worth. I wasn't there to be their best friend, their mother, their confidant. I was hoping I could have a friendly interplay with that client, but, but I wasn't there to be their best friend or their parent. I did give them tools to learn how to reparent themselves, heal themselves, heal the little boy or girl inside them, which you'll see I offer tools for in some of my other videos. But my work was radically, radically different and antithetical to the practice of psychotherapy. It really didn't deal with the mind. Uh, didn't. I didn't fucking care what was in your mind. I didn't care where you thought your pain came from. I knew where your pain came from. It's the same place my pain came from. When I was an infant, But I didn't care. So if a client came to me and wanted to talk about their pain week to week, wanted to discuss their pain with me, wanted to have me climb on board and analyze their pain with them, I'd give them a warning and I'd say, this is not the work I do. If you're wanting that kind of work, you belong in a psychotherapist's office. You don't belong here with me. If you want to discuss this pain ad nauseum, you were raped when you were nine, or your father beat your mother and he beat you, or your mother never really understood you, all those things may be true, but that's not what's going to resolve your pain. All the insight in the world, no matter how much you read, no matter how much treatment you undergo, no matter how many insights you gain about your pain it's not going to resolve it it's not going to heal it it's not going to make it go away it's not going to shrink it you're going to be with that pain the rest of your life it's going to haunt you it's going to keep coming up for you it's going to periodically have you shooting yourself in the foot in this lifetime and ending up back in a psychotherapist's office to untangle that mess you got yourself into. So I was a lousy therapist. 
my my full six years of internship actually technically was seven and a half because neither my supervisor nor I realized that I couldn't continue working under his license and in his office when I'd completed my six years and handed in my hours to start my testing process toward California marriage and family therapist licensure. So I did seven and a half years technically in private practice <laughs> before I branched off out on my own and um, and thought a lot about how do I help these people heal. Well, that wasn't such a far stretch. Really, it wasn't rocket science because I'd had to heal myself over the years. I I used to be really hard on myself, really hard on myself, going looking for shortcomings and flaws <laughs> so that, God forbid, nobody else would notice them and bring them up to me before I noticed them. I used to pride myself on this. Stupid. I mean, it's just dumb. That's as self-destructive as you can get, my dears. Stupid. So one day, by the grace of God, I came out of the ether, and I went, how does this serve me? This trying to be on top of all my short, shortcomings and flaws. How does this actually serve me? What does it give me? What does it do for me? And I realized it gave me nothing positive. What it gave me was a lot of mental masturbation. What it gave me was a lot of depression and inertia. Because every time I'd isolated a shortcoming or flaw, or I remind myself of a past error, well, I got to feel proud of myself for being so on top of my game and so self-aware. <laughs> but at the same time, I experienced a, 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 a lessening of energy and a perpetuation of depression. So I knew this had to stop. So I invented a tool. And it's the cancel tool that I talk about in my online video. Quit being hard on yourself. And that little tool, that little power tool, turned my whole life around. I promise you it did. Now I had more energy. Now I had more impetus. Now I had more focus. Now I had less depression. I could actually get myself out of bed and go about daily tasks. Because I wasn't beating myself to a bloody pulp every goddamn day of my life. I'm giving you other tools that I have used in my practice. This is primarily what my consulting practice has been all about. Just giving you a small handful of power tools to use diligently, daily, religiously. I hate that word. But <laughs> hypervigilantly. <laughs> To eliminate the negative tape that plays 24-7 that basically asserts, I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. And this is how I got people well. This is how I literally got them well. Was just resolving that negative tape, getting it out of them completely, deprogramming it totally. And teaching them how to endure and tolerate, excuse me, difficult emotions in the body without going immediately into the head to hyperanalyze the shit out of them. And this is how people got well here with me. Psychotherapy never gives you these tools. Why not? Why not? Well, as I've said, many of those people came to me as clients. A lot of them were borderline disordered.
And if I could teach them these simplistic, ridiculously simple tools, I can help them start to heal on an emotional level, build self-worth, and grow into their chronological emotional age. But if you're going to somebody, some sort of professional, I don't care who they are, who hasn't done this repair work on themselves, this kind of repair work, not the analysis stuff, this stuff, the fixing the problem at its etiology, right at its core, it seems to me it might be a little like the blind leading the blind. So I was a lousy, terrible therapist. Just didn't have the patience week to week, month to month, year to year to let people come in weekly and just keep going over the same traumatic events <laughs> and attaching the same meaning and reasons to their pain that I'd heard 800 times before. I didn't have the patience. I did not have the patience to go analyzing that pain with them. I didn't have the patience to stand by and watch them struggle with what is my issue and hope that over the course of months or years, I could help them gradually come to a place of self-awareness where they recognized what their issue was. I didn't have the time or the patience. I just didn't have it. I was a lousy therapist. <laughs> didn't have the patience for it. I wanted to smack them upside the head. I go, listen, it doesn't matter why you're in pain. What matters is we can give you tools to eliminate it altogether. And there aren't 30, 40, 50, 60 tools. There's only four or five that will absolutely turn your life radically around. Then your biggest problem will be, how do I tolerate feeling real joy? Ooh, it's such a foreign sensation. I feel so untethered. Pain is grounding to us. It's like walking around in a pair of concrete boots. Okay, your feet are encased in concrete blocks. <laughs> and you've got all this weight on your legs, and it grounds us. Pain does. It makes us aware that we're alive, and, uh, and, uh, and that gravity is holding us down. When you start to experience bliss and joy, we've been chipping away at those concrete blocks. And you're lighter now. And you're not used to feeling light. You're only used to feeling pain. Only used to feeling pain, agony, despair, anxiety. You've got addictions. You've got compulsive behaviors. Maybe you're a compulsive fixer, caregiver, rescuer, because you can't connect it to your can't connect. Excuse me, to your own emotions. So you you get yourself very busy trying to take care of everybody else's. So this is just, I guess, the tip of the iceberg <laughs> in terms of helping you understand um, what I really did for a living for a lot of years and how people benefited from this kind of work um, when psychotherapy had failed them. Again, not to put down psychotherapy can be very valuable. I've had a few good ones along the way. <laughs> but I didn't want to practice it. Just too lengthy a process. So I found something that could help people a lot quicker. I hope this has been educational on some level for you. And I want you to know that I'm wishing you everything you wish for yourself. And I hope to God you don't stop until you find that thing you're wanting and wishing for. 
Bye for now.